Today's presentation is entitled From War to Peace, the year 1921 in Fingal. It began in the middle of the War of Independence, where the country was on a wartime footing and ended in December 1921 with the expectation of peace with the signing of the treaty. Sinn Féin had declared an independent Irish Republic after their victory in the general election of December 1918 and in January 1919 they declared that sovereignty rested within their own parliament, Doyle Erden. The British government response initially was to ignore them and later to underestimate them. In 1920 there were local elections in January and June and Sinn Féin took over local government. This was crucial to winning the War of Independence. In April of 1920, there was a general strike and hunger strikes. But what happened in that month, which was probably more important, was Hamar Greenwood was appointed Chief Secretary and a new team was put in place at Dublin Castle. Sir Neville Macready commanded the British forces in Ireland at that time. The three men that are sitting at the front there, in the front row, are <coughs> Mark Sturgis, John Anderson, one of the Under Secretaries, and Andy Cope. Andy Cope was asked initially by Lloyd George to start trying to open channels of communication with Sinn Féin, and he began almost immediately in April of 1920. And it's his work in the background that paves the way for the truce in the middle of 1921 and eventually the treaty. To begin, I want to go back to the last three or four months of 1920, when the war escalated to a point where everybody was affected by it. We know that in Balbriggan it was sacked by the Black and Tans and auxiliaries from Gormanstown in September 1920. The following month saw the death in Talbot Street after a shootout with Lieutenant Price, a British government agent, of Sean Tracy on the 14th of October. On the 25th of October, Terence McSweeney died after a hunger strike in Brixton Prison. The following month, in November 1920, we are all familiar with the hanging of Kevin Barry at the beginning of the month in Mountjoy Jail, following the killing of a British soldier six weeks earlier. We also know about what happened at Croke Park and in Dublin City on Bloody Sunday on the 21st of November 1920. What's probably less known is what happened on that night of the 21st to the 22nd. The Black and Tans raided a number of premises in Swords. They burnt down Taylor's Pub, the Star, on the main streets in Swords. Patrick Matthews, who was a councillor, a trade unionist, uh, and a member of the Irish Volunteers and Scurries, was shot at his front door again by Black and Tans. They asked him when he answered the door, are you a Sinn Féiner? And he said, no, I'm a Labour man, and they shot him immediately. Jack Rover McCann, who had fought in 1916, was also taken from his house and killed. In December 1920, Thomas Hand, who was a judge in the Sinn Féin court in Skerries uh, and also a member of the IRA, was killed on the 5th of December. The war, which was <coughs> prosecuted at that particular time, involved almost everybody. Whilst in Fingal there was a small amount of IRA in comparison to other parts of the country. There was also the support of local government, Balrodery Rural District Council, North Dublin Rural District Council and Dublin County Council, who were failing to recognise the, or refusing to recognise the local government board and were uh, working in tandem with Doyle Erden. There was instructions to rate collectors from uh, the, the Doyle Erden Department of Local Government not to collect the rates uh, and pass them on to the local government board. The other man that comes in importantly at this time as a very, very important figure is Archbishop Clune of Perth. Now, one of the men you saw in the photograph earlier who was uh, killed in Dublin Castle on the night of Bloody Sunday uh, was Conor Clune, his nephew. Perth ca uh, Clune came back to Ireland in December and was particularly aggrieved at what he saw as reprisals by uh, British troops. And on the 1st of December, Joe Devlin, uh, the MP for the Falls Road in Belfast, arranged a meeting for uh, Archbishop Clune with Lloyd George. Lloyd George uh, 
expressed shock and denounced all the reprisals that Clune had complained about, but he asked Clune to go back to Dublin and speak to the Sinn Féin leaders, which he did over the next few weeks. Within a couple of days, he arrived in Dublin and he met with Arthur Griffith, who at that time was in jail, uh, in Mountjoy jail, and this was arranged by Andy Cope. A couple of days later, Father O'Flanagan, who was a, a vice president of Sinn Féin, sent a telegram to Lloyd George reminding him that Ireland was willing to make peace and would Lloyd George uh, be willing to do so and what steps did he propose to take. At this stage, there was calls throughout the country for some sort of a truce or some sort of a cessation. Roger Sweetman, the TD for Wexford, called for a truce and so did Galway County Council. Clune later met with Collins and with Bishop Fogarty of Killaloo and had further meetings in Mountjoy Jail with Griffith, with Owen McNeil and with Michael Staines. He then met Lloyd George again but discovered at that stage that Lloyd George's attitude had changed and a lot of the demands from the British side had been uh, uh, increased. So Lloyd George said to him quite simply that there would be no separate treatment and there would be a, a partition for the six counties and Northern Ireland. There would be no secession of any part of Ireland from the UK and that they would have to give security guarantees in the event of war. Clune returned back uh, to Dublin, was given permission for, to meet the Doyle. The Doyle was allowed to uh, meet openly for uh, one of the first times to discuss this. He had a long meeting with Griffith. They formulated effectively a draft peace proposal themselves, which was very, very similar to the one that was accepted six, seven months later in July 1921. He brought it back to Lloyd George in London. Just before Christmas, de Valera returned from America uh, where he had been fundraising. The British government met in conclave and they rejected it and were looking at this stage for an escalation of martial law throughout the, the country. At the same time, public opinion in Britain was changing. The Labour Party uh, and the trade unions were calling for some sort of cessation to the violence because the nature of repeated reprisals uh, was not uh, going down well in either America or in Britain. Clune then met with Sturgis, Anderson and Cope, the three men I showed you in the photograph earlier, and they then met together with uh, Griffith and Eamon Duggan in Mount Joy. Whilst the talks broke down, they kept the lines of communication open. So that's the background to 1921. And then we start looking at what is happening. Now, throughout this year of 1921, as I have said, we're looking at from war to peace. There are peace moves in a time of war. And then we'll find later on in the year that there are warlike uh, preparations and there are warlike uh, activities when peace is just about, let's say, to break through. Joseph Taylor from Swords, whose family owned the Star uh, pub that was burnt earlier, was arrested in Dublin City. The Black and Tans were ambushed by the IRA at Hedgestown uh, in Lusk, just quite close to where uh, the workhouse was, Balroderley Workhouse. So at the same time, the government had authorised further reprisals to commence throughout the county of Cork. So you have an escalation in the war at the same time as you had talking going on. There was a meeting took place on the 6th of January between Lloyd George and Father O'Flanagan. Uh, and from that, Father O'Flanagan was asked, would he open communication with de Valera? In January of 1921, there's also an escalation in the war that's going on between the Department of Local Government and various rate collectors around the country. Now, the rate collectors in Dublin County Council and Balroderry Rural District Council were employed uh, as rate collectors, not as Republican activists and not as somebody who was going to be fighting the war on that particular front. All 10 Dublin County Council rate collectors resigned. They were put under pressure then by the Department of Local Government, but to their credit, Dublin County Council supported their position. Molly Adrian, as chairperson of the Poor Law Guardians in Balroderry, met to discuss the rates and the estimates for the year. That was particularly difficult because 
continuous raids by the uh, military, and in particular the Black and Tans, had resulted in arrests, had resulted in not having enough councillors there to actually do the work, but they also took all the account books. So they were in a very, very difficult position. Government funding had been withdrawn. They were dependent on the rates, but the rates were to go through the Department of Local Government. So you had a situation, for instance, where the IRA are blowing up roads, the uh, Crossley tenders are damaging the roads, and the roads are not being prepared and the response are being repaired, and the responsibility for doing that lay fairly and squarely with the local authorities. So people's quality of life was, uh, and their ability to get around was being seriously hampered. On 21st of January, the IRA ambushed an RIC lorry at Drumcondra Bridge, but they were intercepted then by a number of auxiliaries. Uh, five IRA men were captured, four of them were, 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 were later hanged. You also have, uh, at the same time, those nationalists, Michael Dunn in particular, on Balrodery Rural District Council, calling that they cooperate with the local government board in order to take advantage of the funding. So you've persistent raids, you've no account books, you constantly have the workhouse being damaged, and in 1920 it had been occupied by uh, the British military, not by the Black and Tans, but it had been used as billeting for uh, British soldiers. There's three men who are heavily involved, again from the church in the background, in terms of being intermediaries and influencers. The man on the left there is Bishop Fogarty of uh, Killaloo, in the middle is Michael O'Flanagan, who I mentioned was the Vice President of Sinn Féin. He gave one of the speeches, actually, at O'Donovan Ross's uh, funeral in 1915, alongside Patrick Pierce. And on the right is Archbishop Mannix. These men, as senior churchmen, other than Michael O'Flanagan, uh, had influence with uh, politicians, had influence with uh, Doyle Erden, and were seen as honest intermediaries that could work with uh, the British government. When we start to look into the next month in February, we see an increase in the number of raids in Fingal. On the 2nd of February, Constable Samuel Green was shot in uh, an IRC, RIC constable was shot in a public house in Balbriggan and died from his wounds the next day. Two IRA prisoners were uh, interrogated and shot in Clontor the bodies were found in Clontor Park in Drumcondra. The following week, John Dardis in Swords was sentenced to 12 months uh, hard labour for threatening a soldier on the street. And now, John Dardis had a history because John Dardis had spent six months in prison uh, following the rioting in Swords during the lockout in 1913. The following day, Winston Churchill left his job in the War Office and was replaced by Sir Lamming uh, Worthington Evans and Walter Long resigned from his post in Dublin Castle due to ill health. And these two, two changes uh, took two of the more uh, trenchant uh, supporters of uh, martial law and coercion away from uh, the governing group in Dublin Castle. There was various different attacks continued throughout the month. RIC Constable John Patrick Lynch, who was based in Swords Barracks, was killed by an IRA attack near the workhouse. Patrick Howard, uh, an egg dealer in Balscadden, was shot dead by the RIC outside Landy's pub. The man who shot him, uh, Constable Pearson, was found guilty. Uh, he was sentenced to hang, but he was later reprieved uh, after the treaty. The auxiliaries continued to raid Balrodery Workhouse. Uh, they arrested the medical officer from Old Town, Dr. Brian Cusick, who was an, uh, a TD uh, at the end of the month. As I said, the four men that were captured in Drumcondra were later hanged. They were Frank Flood, Patrick Dial, uh, Thomas Bryan, and Bernard Ryan. The fifth IRA man, because he was 17, was uh, reprieved because of his young age. Council revenue f 
shortfall continued at about 20%. So they couldn't afford to pay reliefs. They couldn't afford, they had to look at reducing salaries. They had to look at reducing an awful lot of what they were responsible for in terms of roads maintenance, in terms of sewage, in terms of water. And they had to look at increasing the rate. The rate doubled, cutbacks were implemented. There was an increase in malicious injury claims. And the malicious injury claims was basically claims against the local authorities for uh, damages that were caused either to property or injuries to people. Whether they were caused by the IRA or whether they were caused by the uh, British Crown Forces, the local ratepayers ended up paying for them. In March, 10 men in the civilian clothing raided the workhouse again and took the books. They raided it again the following week. So you have this continuous harassment of the local uh, authorities, you have this continuous harassment of the local people. John O'Neill, uh, an Irish uh, man, worked as a baker with Johnson Mooney and O'Brien and he had a part-time job as a chauffeur. He had fought with the Australian Expeditionary Force in the First World War. He was killed when the car he was driving with a number of golfers going to Port Marnock was mistaken for a car carrying British officers. There was a military ambulance captured by the IRA at Finglas and then they proceeded to use that. By this stage, the IRA had started to appoint rate collectors in place of those who had resigned. Those that resigned were given a reprieve by Dublin County Council until March. The IRA, as you would expect, had slightly different methods in terms of collecting the rates. Now, when you have a war situation, you are inevitably going to have defaulters. You have poverty, you have unemployment during the War of Independence, but you have people who can't pay their rent or won't pay their rent who can't pay their rates or won't pay their rates. And you have people who fall back under annuities, which is the repayment of the loans under the Land Acts. The IRA destroyed 2,000 pounds worth of police equipment at Balbriggan. So you have this effectively a tit for tat uh, war, which is taking place in the early part of 1921. This is a police report of a raid on what was actually taken from Balrodery Workhouse described as seditious literature. It's effectively communications from William T. Cosgrave, the Minister for Local Government, and uh, Balrodery uh, Poor Law Union Guardians and Rural District Council. In April, there is an interesting uh, sequence of events that take place. There is again the, the, the number of killings which are tit for tat. Uh, you have the IRA claimed to have killed a black and tan at Long Hill in Balbriggan. This was from the IRA brigade reports at a later date. Sergeant Kerwin of the RIC was killed in a gunfight at Ballybuckle. Captain Peter White of the IRA also died. Uh, District Inspector Cal was actually killed in friendly fire at Clochran when the uh, constabulary, black and tans, came across a a British military patrol and they fired on each other. What's interesting, and again, this is some correspondence here in relation to the Northern Bank in Skerries that was robbed. Now, it's generally accepted that when banks are robbed during this period, it's the IRA, but you'll also have people that take advantage of the situation. And this correspondence here, it might be written a little bit uh, small, I hope people can see it, um, is when a number of months later, the perpetrator of the crime was accosted or was captured by the IRA and they got the money back and actually sent it. It's signed by um, Michal Olinchik, uh, who was the officer commanding uh, the 8 Fingal Brigade at this stage, uh, who actually returned the money to the bank. The following month, in May, we had arrears of rents are continuing to go to grow arrears of rates and annuities there's continual attacks uh, sergeant joseph anderson was killed at hampton and um, there's a military patrol attacked at santry one of the other very very interesting uh, escapades we'll call it was the attempt to rescue sean mckeown uh, in mountjoy jail uh, emmett dalton dressed up who had been a british officer in the first world war uh, dressed up with 
uh, another IRA man in a, a British Army uniform. They captured an armoured car. They drove the armoured car into uh, Mountjoy Jail, but Sean McKeown wasn't in the governor's office where they expected him to be. The attempt was rumbled and uh, a sentry opened fire on them. They had to withdraw without McKeown and they escaped, but they ended up abandoning the armoured car and they ended up hiding out for a number of days on Patrick Belton's farm in Drumcondra. And Paddy Belton later became the TD, uh, or a, one of the TDs uh, for this area in uh, the 1930s. May is a, a period when we start to see uh, an escalation in violence, but also uh, continuing efforts to bring the war to an end. So the Government of Ireland Act, which had received royal assent on the 23rd of December, came into effect on the 1st of May, and that meant it triggered elections in Northern Ireland and that for the Northern Ireland Parliament, and that would be critical in terms of changing British um, attitudes. Craig and de Valera met in Dublin. Uh, both of them thought the other had called the meeting. Uh, they didn't particularly want to meet each other, and uh, nothing came of it. The date was set for the elections to the Parliament of Southern Ireland, and the Doyle decided they would use those elections for the election to the second Doyle. It wasn't contested, it was all Sinn Féin uh, TDs that were returned, but they refused to recognise the elections for the, uh, for the Senate. Now, at this time, there were those who were objecting to uh, the payment of rates because the rates had increased. One of them was Patrick Joseph Kettle, who was a nephew of Andrew Kettle, who had been involved in uh, the uh, Land League and uh, with uh, Charles Stuart Parnell and was a cousin of Tom Kettle who died in 1916 uh, at the Battle of the Somme and Patrick Belton was the president. And they became a, a pressure group and a thorn in the side of the local authorities and of the government right through the 1920s in terms of representing a combination of North County Dublin farmers and uh, ratepayers. There were attempts to bring additional arms into Ireland. This is a Thompson submachine gun, and this is a photograph of the, the actual machine gun, which is in uh, the National Museum in Collins Barracks. And there were attempts to bring this particular uh, firearm into Dublin. There was, there was uh, talks between Collins and the Fingal IRA looking for somewhere off the north coast that they could bring it in and there are talks that Loch Shinney was one of them. Uh, it never happened because there was 495 of these guns that were intercepted on the quayside at Hoboken, New Jersey on the 24th of May 1921 uh, and were taken in by the American Customs. There was about a half a dozen or ten of them that were being used. Uh, they had been shown uh, to a number of IRA men and these propaganda photographs were taken at around that time. The IRA at the time were running out of ammunition, they were running out of arms um, and this would have been let's say almost a last throw of the dice in terms of being able to maintain um, a military strength and a military presence through their uh, guerrilla warfare. When de Valera returned from the United States in December of 1920, he wanted to change the modus operandi of the IRA, which was working to a, basically a, a strategy dictated by Collins um, uh, and implemented by Collins of guerrilla warfare. He had seen that the, the, the big scale uh, events of 1916 had cost lives and had achieved very, very little. And he wanted a spectacular event and he wanted to attack the Custom House. The Custom House was the centre of British local administration in Ireland. And when I say local administration, it housed the local government uh, uh, board and it housed uh, customs and excise and revenue. And if they destroyed what was there, they would destroy the ability of the British to maintain their administration. 
the day after the arms were found at Hoboken on the 25th of May, 100 IRA men attacked the custom house. They burnt the custom house. Uh, all of those records were lost. Uh, and anything between 80 and 130 IRA men were captured, uh, including a number killed. One of those that was killed there that day was the man on the bottom right there, uh, which is Mahan Lawless. Uh, he fought in the British Army. Uh, he was the son of a Gaelic League activist in Cork who was also a customs and excise uh, agent. And he was a nephew of Frank Lawless. And Frank Lawless at this time was the TD for North County Dublin. Uh, Frank Lawless, uh, together with his two brothers and his sons, had fought in 1916, and he was still a leading member of uh, the IRA at this time. So we never know in terms of what's happening in war, who is on what side and for what reasons, and who may be caught up in it. Mahan Lawless was an innocent bystander. He was working in the Custom House at the time, and he was uh, killed by crossfire from auxiliaries. In June of 1921, there was probably what was the biggest successful uh, engagement on the part of the Fingal Brigade of the IRA when they burned six Coast Guard stations, uh, Malahide, Port Rand, Skerries, Loch Shinney, Rogerstown and Rush, and they also burnt the remount depot uh, at Lusk. The remount depot was where they would have rested and trained and recuperated horses for the British Army. Now, there was an awful lot of uh, resentment locally because there was a lot of uh, economic benefits from having the remount depot there. There were farmers who were involved in training the horses and there was also the supply of hay and the supply of uh, provisions to the troops. So that all disappeared almost overnight. There was about £64,000 worth of damage caused uh, with the burning of the six Coast Guard stations and Fingal County Council uh, have produced an uh, online uh, exhibition about uh, the burning of the six Coast Guard stations, their history uh, and what happened on the particular night. There was also a number of IRA men on the run in Fingal. Now, the War of Independence in Fingal, because of the terrain, there's no mountains, it's largely flat, and because of the high military presence. Remember you had the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries in Gormanstown, which yes, is County Mead, but it's also uh, very, very close to Balbriggan. And you had a big British Army uh, presence at Collinstown uh, Barracks, which is now uh, Dublin Airport. So it was an area that there wasn't really free movement. Um, there wasn't really anywhere to hide, but there were a number of IRA men on the run and they would have formed, let's say, the makings of uh, an active service unit or the equivalent of a flying column, which was based at Moortown uh, near Old Town. They were involved with the 1st Eastern Division in an attack on a troop train at Selbridge uh, in June of 1921. Also at that time, while we have that escalation in activity in the Fingal area, we have a number of men who are working in the background in trying to broker a truce. And these five men are critical. And they're all from, or not all of them, but four of them uh, are from a, what we would call largely a unionist background. On the top left is the Earl of Middleton, and then Sir Morris Dockrell, who was uh, the union, uh, Unionist MP for Rat Mines and the only Unionist MP to have been uh, elected in 1918. The man in the waistcoat uh, to the right is Andrew Jemison of the Jemison Distillery uh, family. That's his house there on the right at uh, Sutton, uh, Sutton Castle, which um, I, I unashamedly uh, have that photograph up because that's where I had my wedding reception when it was a... Uh, a hotel uh, and it's now uh, private apartments. The man on the bottom left is Sir Morris Moore who was involved in the formation of the volunteers and was director of training in the volunteers and the national volunteers uh, in 1914 and we have uh, on the bottom right uh, General Jan Smuts uh, from South Africa. Now De Valera had asked Morris Moore a couple of months earlier to go to South Africa because the Boers had 
a, a degree of independence that they have a, had achieved after the Boer War in South Africa to talk to Smuts about how they did it. Jemison had funded Dublin Corporation when they ran out of money in his role as one of the directors of the Bank of Ireland in 1920. And Dockrell and uh, the Earl of Middleton had been involved during the period of the Irish Convention in 1917 in terms of trying to find an accommodation. And they were working behind the scenes uh, in June of 1921, trying to broker contacts. De Valera and uh, Lloyd George opened communication using uh, these particular intermediaries, and they decided that there was probably the grounds to uh, open a more concrete uh, communication. Smuts met De Valera in Dublin on the 5th of July. De Valera was arguing for a republic, while Smuts said, based on his political experience, don't go that far because the British will not concede a republic. He said that the compromise that ended the Boer War uh, and the relationship that had developed since had been based on uh, a participative agreement. Middleton then met Lloyd George and Lloyd George agreed to the exclusion of Craig. Originally, he wanted Craig to be involved uh, on behalf of Ulster and Northern Ireland in all of the consultations. After talking for a day, De Valera then uh, uh, telegraphed Lloyd George that he would meet him to discuss effectively just talks about talks. McCready and Middleton met the Sinn Féin leaders in Dublin then on the 8th of July and there was huge crowds and huge expectation uh, outside the Mansion House. Lawrence O'Neill, uh, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, had facilitated it. And one of the things that really jumps out and from this particular photograph is not just the crowd, but the fact that they have invoked uh, the flag of the United States as trying to put pressure on the British. Arthur Griffith and McCready were both welcomed to uh, cheering crowds. And after the discussions on that particular day, Andy Cope was also involved, they declared a truce which started on the 11th of July, uh, three days later uh, at noon, and there was a cessation of activities. Now, when we look at the 11th of July and the cessation, that's an important date in terms of uh, assessing where the IRA were at and where uh, the War of Independence was at. As I said earlier, there was an awful lot of talks going on in the background when the war was at its height. And now that we have a truce, we actually see the opposite happening to an extent. So if we look at the IRA in Fingal at this time on the 11th of July, According to their brigade reports, they had carried out 16 separate operations between the 1st of July 1920 and the 11th of July 1921. They had 614 men that they said were in the IRA at that time, commanded by Michael Lynch and uh, his uh, vice uh, officer commanding, Michael Rock. Thomas Peppard was the intelligence officer, and I'll, I'll come to him again, uh, excuse me, uh, slightly later. Michael Lynch had been involved with the Dublin Brigade. At this stage, the 8th Brigade, which was Fingal, was attached to uh, Meath under Sean Boylan and the 1st Eastern Division. Michael Lynch had been asked by Michael Collins not to escalate matters because they needed somewhere as a rest area for some of the Dublin IRA, but also that they would have a channel to the north if it was needed. There were others who disagreed, in particular Daniel Brophy, uh, another leading IRA man, uh, who thought that with the amount, and actually in, in fact Richard Mulcahy later on because he criticised them, uh, there were so many auxiliaries, black and tans and military in the area that they should have been attacked a little bit more. We'll never get uh, the full uh, truth to that, but I'm inclined to think that there is an awful lot of veracity in the claim of Michael Lynch and his conversations with uh, Michael Collins. The IRA in the area was split into four different areas. Uh, the uh, north, uh, the middle area, which is mainly Nethercross, which was split into the second and fourth battalions, and the third battalion in the south. Uh, there's a list of where the 614 men were. 
and there was also 131 active members of uh, Cumann de Mon at that particular time. Following the truce on the 11th of July, a delegation set sail for uh, London to meet with Lloyd George. This is a photograph of them, uh, Arthur Griffith, uh, Robert Barton, De Valera, and on the right, uh, Lawrence O'Neill, the Lord Mayor of Dublin. I don't know who the gentleman with the beard is uh, at, at the moment. And they stayed in the Grosvenor Hotel uh, in London. The expectations at the time among the Irish in London were, hu were huge. And we're all familiar now with Whitehall and the, the entrance and the gates to uh, Downing Street. That wooden uh, fence there at the back is just at the entrance to Downing Street. And there would have been groups, massive crowds, who would have met on each day that there were meetings uh, at that particular time and said uh, decades of the rosaries. So they left for London on the uh, 12th of July. On the 14th of July, De Valera and Lloyd George have their full, first full meeting. Lloyd George offered dominion status, but threatened there be further coercion if there was no settlement. The following day, they met again, and De Valera now started to play with words. He looked for an independent but associated republic rather than a full republic. Lloyd George refused, and Lloyd George said at the third meeting, a couple of days after that again, that if there was no partition, then there would be civil war. There was playing between partition and civil war and what might happen next. The British cabinet agreed that their proposals, and they were prepared to accept the, the use of the word treaty, was a qualified dominion status for Southern Ireland, where they would have full control of their own taxation, finance and land defence forces, but would have no navy. There would be bases for the Royal Navy. There would be restrictions on numbers in the Irish army. Uh, there would be rights of recruiting for the British and there would be free trade between the two countries and Ireland would contribute to the outstanding British war debt. In addition, Ireland would have to recognise the existing powers and privileges of Northern Ireland, which could not be changed except by the consent of the people in Northern Ireland. De Valera then withdrew. They met in the Grosvenor Hotel and the next day he rejected those proposals and went back to demanding full dominion status for all of Ireland. So they then returned to Dublin with those uh, uh, proposals. They were discussed by uh, the Doyle and they issued a statement. Uh, De Valera then uh, and rejected them. De Valera then replied to Lloyd George, calling, again, had moved to calling for uh, full separation and for partition to be decided by the Irish, not by the British. Lloyd George again rejected this. So this was going back and forth and back and forth. Then Lloyd George released correspondence with Jan Smuts, which led almost to a breakdown in communications completely. Now, while these talks are going on, we also have both sides remaining vigilant and we still have levels of activity. So these are taken from uh, British military intelligence reports on the Fingal Brigade in September of 1921. And it says quite simply, Republican police continue to work in certain parts of the Fingal area. Two young men were arrested uh, following uh, incidents around Heary's public house in Finglas, and also that they have reliable information that the house occupied by a man called Wilson, the father of Red Wilson uh, at Balheary, uh, is being used as an IRA prison, and it was being used to house both those that were deemed to be local criminals, and in some cases those that were deemed to be enemies of uh, let's say, the IRA or the Irish Republic that was declared. At the same time, the communications between De Valera and Lloyd George are going on, and we are getting closer to, at the end of uh, the month, to what becomes the treaty negotiations. Now, at the same time, we have in October a number of reports from the Irish volunteers on activities in 
the Fingal area. And this in particular is about the good work that was being carried out on an ongoing basis, the proficiency and uh, the activities of Thomas Peppard. On the 14th of September, the Doyle appointed a delegation to uh, a conference with uh, the British government. De Valera himself announced, as we all know, that he would not go and was supported by Brewer, Stack and Barton in this, but was opposed by Griffith, by Collins, particularly uh, strongly, and by Cosgrave. De Valera, having the casting vote of the seven, uh, won out. Um, the delegation that went was Arthur Griffiths, who was the chairman, Michael Collins and Robert Barton. They were accompanied by lawyers, Eamon Duggan and George Gavin Duffy, and the secretaries were Erskine Childers, John Chartres, uh, Dermot O'Hegarty, who was also the secretary of Doyle Erden, and Finian Lynch, who was the assistant secretary of Doyle Erden. The Doyle approved the delegation, despite Collins protesting, and the Doyle gave them plenipotentiary status. Now, this, this is key when we look at, at the treaty negotiations, but the cabinet gave instructions to them as delegates that all major decisions should be referred back to Dublin. Now, legally, the cabinet could not limit the powers given by the Doyle. So the instructions from the Doyle were those that had the highest legal status. And referring back to Dublin was more guidelines than anything else. And that was probably the way it was interpreted. In fact, we know that's the way it was interpreted by uh, Collins and Griffith. So they begin to uh, negotiate in October uh, in London. And I just want to stop for a moment and then just talk about what life was like in Fingal at that particular time and the damage that was done to relations and relationships uh, during that particular period. This is a, an intelligence report on enemy agents in Fingal at that particular time. And when we look at it, it is a list of everybody who is deemed to be an enemy agent. Everybody who had any government position was listed. Anybody who was a station master of a railway. Everybody who was a postmaster or a postmistress. They list an awful lot of who were deemed to be leading Protestants and leading Unionists in the area. Here in Swords, in fact, very, very close to where we are at the moment in Swords Castle, one of the farmers, James Dickey, was named uh, as uh, an enemy agent. So was Malahide Golf Course, because British soldiers or British officers uh, had a habit of playing golf there. So what you have is you have the encouragement of spying and snooping on one's neighbours. And this pertains right through into uh, the 1920s in terms of degrees of mistrust and falling out, quite apart from anything that happens in the Civil War and the Civil War period. Um, so these are in uh, the military archives. Uh, they are reports that were sent from uh, intelligence officers directly to Michael Collins uh, or Michael Collins's office at, at this time. And they are an eye opener in terms of what is happening on the ground and who is involved and surprisingly naming names and, and, and naming uh, people. So in November and December, we're looking at the uh, period of the negotiations intensifying in London. On the Irish side, Griffin and Collins were involved in every one of the subcommittees and every one of the meetings. On the British side, only Austin Chamberlain was involved in all the meetings. They kept changing, but the three lead negotiators uh, seen there on the bottom right were Lloyd George, Effie Smith, who was Lord Birkenhead, and uh, Winston Churchill. There was also at this time calls to amalgamate all of the Dublin uh, poor law unions, which were rejected locally. Um, and, and that was putting additional pressure on local government in this, in, in, in this area in particular. On the 5th of November, Finnegan, or, uh, 
Sinn Féin held their Ardesh with 1,500 delegates. Griffith, while he was in London, met with the Southern Unionists, the Earl of Middleton and, and Andrew Jemison, uh, and uh, promised to safeguard and recommend safeguards for their interests. So you have these uh, negotiations going on in London. They're covered in, to, to an extent in the newspapers. Um, and meanwhile, back at home, you still have IRA activities because nobody knows what's going to happen. The burning of Balbriggan resulted in the destruction of the Deeds Templar uh, hosiery factory, uh, and they put in a claim of £62,000 uh, against Dublin County Council uh, for the damages. And at this stage, Kevin O'Higgins, who was acting minister for local government, he was assistant minister for local government, uh, but uh, Cosgrave had been in and out of hospital. He has actually written to Andy Cope in Dublin Castle and has warned him that if they continue to present this uh, claim, it's in contravention of the truce. So you have activity is still happening on the ground. There tends to be at a, at a certain level a view that when the truce is called and the negotiations are going on, that everything has come to a cessation. Uh, it hasn't. There's continuous uh, reports on uh, the conduct of the Fingal Brigade, who are still in training. Uh, and a lot of this training is taking place in County Mead. And if you see there uh, across the 8th Brigade, um, their musketry, they got a result of very fair, signalling fair, general training good, discipline good, uh, attendance at parades good, and uh, very satisfactory in terms of general remarks. So there is an attempt to maintain a war footing uh, in Fingal. The delegation from London returned to Dublin in late November and then went back to London. Uh, at this stage, Dublin County Council is forced to start reducing salaries and there's rows over the outstanding payments of war bonuses at the same time. We're all familiar with the immediate lead up to uh, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which is signed on the 6th of December. Um, it's signed at 10 past two in the morning on the 6th of December. The British cabinet approved it unanimously the next day and approved the release immediately of 4,000 internees. Two days later, it was approved by the Doyle cabinet by four to three. The person who had changed was Barton, who was part of uh, the delegation. It was ratified by the House of Commons uh, by 401 votes to 58 on the 16th of December and by the House of Lords as well. When the internees were being released from Ballykinler camp, three local men uh, from Swords, Frank Lawless, Joseph Lawless and Daniel Brophy, were on the train and it was a track before it left Northern Ireland territory. The treaty was approved by the Doyle by 64 votes to 57 on the 7th of January. This photograph here is the one, it's from the National Museum of Ireland collection, um, and it's the one that probably resonates most with me because I don't know whether these men look tired, they look almost startled, I don't know whether it's the flash or it's the fact that they were worn down uh, and worn out and knew exactly what they had signed and what the reaction might be. We've seen a year, 1921, in Fingal that started with war and ended with peace. But during the peace, we still had preparations for war. And during the war, we still had people looking for peace. 1922 would prove that that peace was short-lived. Thank you.